hymn 102, My God, How Wonderful You Are. Our subject really is founded on that hymn that we've just sung. Uh, the hymn in our hymn book um, comes under the section heading of God Praise, which of course it is. But as we consider what the writer has in mind in this hymn, we see that it's really a, a contemplation of the awesome majesty of the almighty God. Also, the writer contemplates the mercy and the compassion and the love of this almighty God, that which he has for his creation and particularly for mankind upon, upon this earth. Before we look at the content of the hymn then, perhaps we should look a little at the background to its origin. Um, the music to the hymn um, was written um, by uh, James Turl in 1802. Uh, he was an English organist and composer, and the tune of this hymn is, is known as Westminster, and it's one of the best known of his works. Uh, the words of the hymn were written by Frederick William Faber, a noticed English, noted English hymn, hymn writer and theologian. He converted from Anglicanism uh, to Roman Catholicism in 1845. The reason we say that is, is because the original uh, hymn actually consisted of seven verses. Um, but being of Roman Catholic origin, then we should not be surprised that there are sentiments in the original hymn which we as Christian Elphians could not accept. Page two. Our hymn book, uh, in our hymn book then, verse one is the, uh, as the original, uh, it's got a slight modification. Uh, verse two was verse six in the original hymn, uh, with, again with very slight modification. Verses three and verse four are as in the original, and verse five in our hymn book is a repeat of verse one. Therefore, from the original, verses two, five and seven uh, have been omitted. Having said this, the, the content of the hymn is full in, of scriptural uh, references, uh, some of which uh, we will now be referring to in order to understand uh, the sentiments uh, be, behind this, this hymn. So verse 1 then, the hymn opens by contemplating the awesome majesty of the only one who is the mighty creator of heaven and earth. My God, how wonderful thou art, thy majesty, how bright. For background then, when Moses was leading the children of Israel in the wilderness, uh, because of the disobedience and their waywardness of the people, Moses was moved to erect a tent of meeting outside the camp of, uh, of the people. And here the Lord God then would meet with Moses outside the camp. We're going to Exodus chapter 33. Um, Koroj Siose, Exodus 33. And we're going to start at verse 8, uh, hashed. And it came to pass when Moses went out unto the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses. And all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door. Verse 11, and the, the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh to his friend. And he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. So it's here then that the Lord, Jesus, the Lord God spoke to Moses face to face, as a man speaks to his friend. But as will become obvious, this meeting was not with the Almighty himself, but must have been with an angelic representative. But the point of interest here is that Moses desired a confirmation that the Lord God was with his people, 
and as they journeyed through this wilderness journey. Page 3, um, same chapter, um, <coughs> verse 17, Hiftar. Verse 17, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. 18, And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. 19, And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. 20, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. 21, And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock. 22, And it shall come to pass, while my glory passeth by, that I will put thee in the cliff of the rock, and will cover thee with my hand, while I pass by. 23, And I will take away mine hand, and thou shalt see my back parts, my, but my face shall not be seen. Such is the magnificence of the Almighty God that no mortal man can look upon him and live. So in order to accommodate Moses' request, the Lord God said that Moses would see only as God passed, so only the glory of God as it passed by him. Moses could not look on the physical presence of the Almighty and live. But he was permitted to look upon the divine character. And so Moses was commanded to um, ascend Mount Sinai, where the glory of the Almighty would pass before him. Um, Exodus 34, Siho Chaha, um, and verse 6. Shesh. Verse 6. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, God merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. Seven, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and the fourth generation. Eight, and Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And it's these attributes of the Almighty that are of importance to us. It is uh, the same attributes which we see in the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Jesus himself says, He that has seen me has seen the Father. We get that in uh, the Gospel of John 14, verse 9. After 40 days, when Moses came down from the mount, such a result uh, of being in the divine presence was that Moses' face shone. Um, verse 28, Bisto hashed. And he was there with the Lord forty days and forty nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, uh, the Ten Commandments. 29. And it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two ta tables of t the testimony of Moses in Moses' hand, when he came down from the mount, that Moses wist not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. Verse 30, And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. So consequently then, that the people were afraid to meet with Moses, and they insisted that Moses wore a veil while he spoke with them. So no man can see God and live. Only immortal, resurrected Jesus can abide in the presence of the Almighty. Page four. Just go to First uh, Timothy, chapter six. Um, Aval Timotheus Shesh. And verse sixteen. Shunzdar. Talking of Jesus, it says, Who only hath immortality, dwelling in light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen or can see, to whom be honour and power uh, for ever. 
everlasting. Amen. This is Jesus in the presence of the Almighty God, of course. The second section of this first verse is, How beautiful thy mercy seat that shines with healing light. So while in the wilderness, uh, Moses was also given specific instructions regarding the building of the tabernacle, as we briefly looked at this morning. The tabernacle is a tent. It was to be erected in the midst of the camp as a place for worship and sacrifice for the people. A brief description then, this tabernacle consisted of three main parts. There was an outer court where the people would bring their sacrifices to. Within the court there was a further structure with an entrance into the holy place where only the priest could enter to attend a lampstand and the table of showbread. Further inside the inner structure with the most holy in, was the most holy place being separated from the holy place by a veil. Admittance into the ho most holy place was only permitted once a year and only by the sanctified high priest and in the most holy place then was the ark of God so go back to Exodus chapter 25 Kuraj Bist O Panj going to verse 10 uh, 10 to 10 to 11 uh, Hifdar, sorry, um, Dar to Yazdar, 10. And they shall make an ark of shitting wood. Two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. 11. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, within and without shalt thou overlay it, and shall make upon it a crown of gold round about and if you go on to verse uh, 17 uh, Hifdar and thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof and a cubit and a half the breadth thereof 18 and thou shalt make two cherubims of gold of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat 19 and make one cherub on the one end and the other cherub on the other end even of the mercy seat shall ye make the cherubim on the two ends thereof. 20. And the cherubim shall stretch forth their wings on high, uh, covering the mercy seat with their wings, and their faces shall look one toward another. Uh, toward the mercy seat shall the faces of the cherubim be. 21. And thou shalt put the mercy seat above the, upon the ark, and in the ark thou shalt put the testimony that I shall give thee. 22, and there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I will give thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. You'll notice in verse 22 that the mercy seat is where the Almighty God would meet with the high priest, who was there as a representative of the people. And this was only possible once a year and only when the high priest had presented the required sacrifice. Such is the majesty then and the purity of the only true God that there was no other way that he could be approached or meet with corruptible mankind. Page 5. But regarding the mercy seat, as we've just read, it was a covering for the ark of the testimony and the mercy seat was the place where God could meet with his people. It is here where the high priest, with the sacrificial blood of atonement, pleads forgiveness for the sins of the people, that they might once more be considered cleansed in the, in the sight of the Almighty God. Hence the phrase, the mercy seat, that shines with healing light, as we read in our hymn. But in the Old Testament, the whole of the tabernacle structure was a, pointy, a pointer to the sacrifice that would follow even the Lord Jesus Christ. So in the New Testament, the resurrected Jesus is described as our mercy seat. It is therefore only through Christ and his perfect sacrifice that we can approach the Almighty Creator. 
Go to Romans chapter 3. Um, Romeoan uh, Seh. Romans chapter 3, and we're going to read from verse 20. Uh, Bist. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all, all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. So talking of the perfect sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, the apostle in verse 25 tells us that God has set Jesus forth to be a propitiation to the faith in his blood. Difficult word, but propitiation in the original Greek is uh, hilasterion, which is mercy seat. It's the same word. In the epistle to the Hebrews, Hebrian uh, no, uh, chapter 9, where the apostle is writing about the Ark of the Old Testament tabernacle, the same word is actually translated as mercy seat from the Greek. So Jesus, the light of the world, who is our mercy seat, because he is our mercy, because only through Jesus can we approach the Heavenly Father, and only through him can we stand cleansed or healed from our sins in in our Father's presence. So, verse number two then starts with how wonderful, how beautiful the sight of thee must be. This is page six. And the writer continues with his contemplation of the awesomeness of this almighty God. And in his thoughts, he now tries to imagine the beauty of God's physical appearance. But as we considered in the previous verse, there is no way that mortal man uh, can look upon the purity uh, and greatness of of, of the Lord God and live. So the scriptures throughout present us with pictures of a divine being, and it presents them having the same physical attributes as ourselves. We're told that he walked through the camp in the wilderness. Uh, in battle, the arm of the Lord is revealed. The Lord God hears, he sees, he speaks. We're told that he, he, that man was created in his image. And this even more so in the Lord Jesus Christ, who showed to the world his character, uh, the character of his Father. And we're also told that Jesus now sits at the right hand of God in the heavens. But perhaps the almighty, all-powerful God does not have a physical form, but is an all-powerful spirit. Or perhaps he's, he, uh, like his angels, Uh, who are ministering spirits he might take on the form to suit a particular purpose and this is summed up in the in the second part of the verse thine endless wisdom boundless power and awful purity surely then with our finite minds we are incapable of even perceiving what endless wisdom and boundless power and awful purity really means It was these same thoughts uh, that filled the mind of the psalmist. The one who knows all things, the one who is all-powerful, the one who is so pure that he cannot abide with corruptible mortal creation. And that's the psalm we read, uh, Psalm 139. This is going to challenge me now. It's Mazamir Sadosi O... No. 
Psalm 139. And this is what we read, isn't it? Um, verse 1, yeah. O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me, thou knowest my down sitting and mine uprising, thou understandest my thought afar off. Three. Thou compassest my path, my lying down, and art acquainted with, with all my ways. Four. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. Five. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and laid thine hand upon me. Six. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain to it. 7. Whither shall I go from thy spirit, or whither shall I flee from thy presence? 8. If I ascend up to heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. 9. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the earth. 10. Even there shall thy hand lead, thee, lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. 11. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. 12. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. 13. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. 14. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvellous are thy works, and that's my soul knoweth right well. 15. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in a continuance are fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. 17. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! 18. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sun, and when I awake, I am still with thee. In our hymn, verse 3, it opens with, O oh, how I fear thee, living God, with deepest, tenderest fears. The God whom we worship is a true and living God. He's not like the idols manufactured from the imagination of men. Just go in the psalm, Psalm 115. 115, Mazamir Sad Odo O Panj. Think. And um, verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but by thy na- but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. 2. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? 3. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. 4. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. 5. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. 6. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. 7. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. 8. They, they that make them are like unto them. So is every one that trusteth in them. 9. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. 10. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. 11. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. 12. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. 13. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. Second part of this third verse, and worship thee with trembling hope and penitential tears, we read. When we consider our waywardness, our sinful nature, then if we have any regard for the one who gives life itself, then surely we are filled with great remorse for the way that we have lived and the way that we do live in his presence. If we truly feel remorse in our hearts, then we will also have this desire to put ourselves right with God. And this is demonstrated by belief. It's by demonstrated by repentance and seeking forgiveness for our sins in the waters of baptism. 
Really, so, no, such remorse is no better demonstrated than by that penitent woman recorded in Luke chapter 7. New Testament, Gospel of Luke chapter 7. Uh, Locker Haft. And we're going in at verse 36, see O'Shea. And one of the Pharisees desired him, that this is Jesus, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, bought an alabaster box of ointment. 38. And stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears. And he wiped them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Moving on to verse 44, uh, Cheselo Chaha. And he turned, Jesus turned to the woman and said, uh, turned turn to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I had entered into thy house, they gave me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. 45. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came, came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet 46 my head with oil that is not anointed but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment 47 wherefore I say unto thee her sins which are many are forgiven for she loved much but to whom little is forgiven the same loveth little and he said to her thy sins are forgiven thee Verse 4, Yet I may love thee too, O Lord, almighty as thou art. Despite that which we have considered regarding the majesty and the holiness of the Almighty, uh, page 8, in his commandments to the children of Israel, the greatest of all the commandments, as endorsed by the Lord Jesus Christ, is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. That's recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. So here we're told by the Lord God himself that not only are we to, able to love him, but rather the Almighty himself demands of us that we love him with all our being. And the psalmist writes of this, Psalm 116. Masamir sad odar o shish. Psalm 116, verse 1. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he has inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. And verse 12, Davstar. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? 13. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. 14. I will pay my vows unto the Lord, now in the presence of all his people. 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. 16. O Lord, truly I am thy, I am thy servant. I am thy servant and the son of thine handmaid. Thou hast loosed my bond. 17. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will call upon the name of the Lord. 18. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all this people. And the second part of that um, fourth verse is, For thou hast stooped to ask of me the love of my poor heart. So the writer contemplates how that the Lord God, who dwells in the highest heavens, he who is almighty in power is also tender and merciful. Such that as far as is possible the almighty creator has condescended to reach out in love to, uh, to all we who have a desire to reciprocate that love in faithful obedience. And in this respect we need look no further than the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for his father. The Lord Jesus fulfilled that great commandment to the full. 
He gave himself willingly each day of his life in submission to his Father's will. He willingly laid down his life in sacrifice as was required of him. And this is the love that the Lord God is seeking from each one of us. And we are assured that if we are faithful and sincere in our submission to the Father's will, then by his grace we too, like Jesus, will receive the gift of eternal life. That we might be permitted to worship our God in the perfection even throughout eternity. Page 9. Which brings us to verse 5. And as we stated from the outset, verse 5 is a, re a repeat of verse 1. So we've already considered that. So in conclusion then, we hope that it's been helpful for us to consider the, the meaning behind the words of this hymn. In doing so, we've been able to focus our minds upon the awesome greatness and the majesty, the boundless power and the abundant mercy that the Almighty Creator has for we who are but dust of the earth. James chapter 4 verse 14 puts it this way, For what is your life if it is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away? So such are we in the presence of the Lord. Yet because of his abundant love for us, he gave his only begotten Son in sacrifice for our sins, that we might love him. And in the fullness of time when the Lord Jesus returns, we by his grace and mercy might be able to dwell uh, with the Almighty himself and he with us. And so we're going to close with the words of um, 1 John chapter 3. Naame, Avale, Johanna, C. See, yeah. 1 John chapter 3. Verse 1, yeah. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because he, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Verse 9, no. Whosoever is born of God doth commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. 10. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Verse 11. For this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that we should love at one another. Verse 12. Not as Cain, who was of that... I think I'm looking at the wrong chapter here, aren't I? I'm looking... Sorry, chapter 4. Apologies. Chapter 4, verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God. Sorry, I'm on the chapter again now, aren't I? Right, try again. Chapter 4, verse 9. In this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent his, his only Son, the begotten Son, into the world, that we might live through him. Here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation, that's that word mercy seat, for our sins. Beloved, if God, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man hath seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Thank you.